Hi, I'm Kelly Kramer. And I'm Scott Sipker. Welcome to the Greater Des Moines Botanical Garden. And our fourth season of Iowa Outdoors. Coming up on this edition of Iowa Outdoors, we'll combine the outdoors with some global positioning satellites and see where the journey takes us, from trails to treasure. We explore the geodesic features of the Greater Des Moines Botanical Garden as it relaunches itself for the 21st century with a mix of plants from the world's warmest climates. We motor up Iowa's inland waterways with DNR fishery staff in eastern Iowa for a research project examining the trials and tributary tribulations of the shovel-nosed sturgeon. And we'll spend some quality time with fungi, and one man who specializes in photographing the eclectic world of mushrooms, from the commonplace to the extraordinary. We'll have all that and more. So sit tight, Iowa Outdoors is about to begin. Funding for Iowa Outdoors is provided by the Claude P. Small, Catherine Small Cousins, and William Carl Cousins Fund at the Lincoln Way Community Foundation in Clinton County to support nature programming on Iowa Public Television. Mid-American Energy, helping to harness renewable sources of electricity through their investment in wind power. Information is available at midamericanenergy.com. Mid-American Energy, obsessively, relentlessly at your service. Many of Iowa's natural wonders you'll find on IPTV can be found in Iowa Outdoors Magazine, the Iowa DNR's premier resource for conservation, education, and recreation activities. Subscription information can be found online at iowadnr.gov. Welcome to Iowa's capital city and its signature botanical garden, a climate-controlled oasis for some native plants and others not found in our state parks. This geodesic dome stands 80 feet tall at its highest point, as more than 600 plexiglass panels maintain control of moisture and temperature. It's something that's important during our state's frigid winters and unpredictable springs. We'll explore how this 40-year-old structure is reinventing itself for the 21st century with technology and gardening. But first, we'll take you on a journey of digital hide-and-seek. In just a decade, a new outdoor high-tech activity has taken off throughout Iowa. It's called geocaching, and anyone can do it. All you need is a handheld GPS device or smartphone, and off you go. Hunting for hidden treasure in the heart of the city or the rural countryside. Either way, your adventure is a great way to get out and explore Iowa's outdoors. So are we going to go find Oak Leaf or no? Because the Oak Leaf are... one is this way. Which way? Well, Oak Leaf. This way, we yeah, it's this way. Okay. It's that way. So that way? Yeah. On an early spring weekend, hunters from all over Iowa and across the Midwest wander through Honey Creek State Park on Rathbun Lake in southern Iowa. They target hidden treasures, not animals. And instead of weapons, they come armed with GPS, or Global Positioning System receivers. These hunters are called geocachers. For me, we like to be outside, and that's one of my main loves of it. And then just be able to go find stuff because it's a fun scavenger hunt, and it's not, you know, it's not an expensive hobby to go do. You can put as much into it, and then we can just stop and find stuff. For me, not as addictive as some, but pretty darned addictive. It, 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 you can go every weekend. You can go three or four times a week during the week if you want to, if the caches are there. Geocaching is a recreational activity, a high-tech game of hide-and-seek in which participants use a GPS device or smartphone to place and find hidden containers called caches. Each cache is marked by a set of coordinates and logged on a website. So it gives us a map, and then we're gonna go to, um, back to our compass, and then our compass will actually lead us and tell us how many distance, the feet, and the navigation to how far we go. Caches come in a variety of shapes, sizes, and containers. The website listing will tell you what size you're looking for. The smallest caches, called nanos, can be as tiny as the tip of your finger. An ammo can is an example of a regular-sized cache. Most caches, even the tiny nanos, contain a log for you to sign to prove that you found it. Some of them also contain trinkets or swag. So it could be just something as simple as like a McDonald's cat, like a McDonald's toy, a whistle, if we could drop a quarter in, a piece of gum. 
to something, you take something, leave something. It's a fairly new hobby. Geocaching started in 2000 and has grown in popularity since then. There are now more than 18,000 caches hidden all over Iowa and more than 2.3 million in the world. Just about anywhere you might travel, you can geocache. There are caches in every state in the country and on every continent on Earth. There's even a cache on the International Space Station. We can do kayaking, running, walking, uh, fishing. You know, you're only limited by what you can think uh, because no matter where you go, with a few exceptions, there's always going to be a geocache or two in the, in the neck of the woods. Road stops, rest stops, softball tournaments, lakes, campgrounds, any place, downtown areas. So they're hidden at everywhere. Geocaches are rated one through five for level of difficulty and the type of terrain. One is the easiest and five is the most difficult. Like if you had to climb a tree, that might be a three. But if you just had to walk on a sidewalk, it'd be a one or a one and a half. The one uh, rating for a train means a person, uh, a wheel, wheelchair bound person can retrieve and replace the cache. There's a cache at the bottom of Lake Okoboji that nobody has found and you need to have scuba gear to go get it. Uh, and that's a five. A five star terrain means you have special equipment. Scuba, ladder, uh, metal detector. There's one up at Iowa State that's at the very, very tippy top of a tall pine tree. I have one up here that you have to crawl about 200 feet down a tunnel. So if you're claustrophobic, that's probably not one for you. You just need to find a teammate that's not, and they can go get it. Anyone can geocache, from young to old, from disabled to the most athletic adventurers. Families and friends can geocache together. It's a good way to get outside and enjoy nature, explore new surroundings, or even experience parts of your own community. Inadvertently, you're gonna get some exercise. I mean, whether it's walking, running, biking, it's a really good hobby to get you out of the living room, out in, in front of that TV set and out the, outdoors. The other thing that's really kind of fun about this is this hobby, sport, activity, whatever you wanna call it, will take you to places that you never knew existed yeah. um, and find things that you never knew were out there. Here's how you get started. First, go to a listing site. Geocaching.com is the most popular and it's free to use. Search for a specific location you want to geocache. The site will provide a listing of all the caches registered in that area. You can then plug in your GPS receiver and download the information about the caches you want to find. If you don't have a GPS receiver, you can also download a geocaching app for your smartphone. There are a couple basic rules of geocaching. Never take a cache. Always put it back the same way you found it. And if the cache has swag and you take something, you need to leave something in exchange. A geocacher is a geocacher. A non-geocacher is a muggle based off the Harry Potter seri movie series. And then if a cache comes up missing after it was originally hidden, then it's called, it mean, you would say it got muggled. And whether or not actually a human took it or a, a raccoon came out of the woods and took it, that happens. You don't have to hike through the woods to go geocaching. There are caches hidden in urban areas too. Downtown Des Moines has several, as do other cities small and large throughout Iowa. It actually, they're Jaden's favorite. Um, the urban caches are usually nanos, and they're usually on something metal, and they're usually so tiny you have to do everything you can to find it, and they're magnetized to it. Yeah, I like the small ones. Like, like some people think they're really hard, but for me, like, they just, like, sometimes they just stick out, and it's kind of easy. For many cashers, it doesn't really matter what they find. The real fun is the adventure of the hunt. I found it! The aha moment when you find it, and then if it is cleverly hidden, or it's a neat container, and that just brings a smile to your face. You can make it whatever you want it to be. You can make it the social aspect, you can make it uh, quick, easy finds in an urban area, you can make it looking for difficult ones. Uh, caching for me, is about being outside. I like the thrill of finding something. As fun as geocaching can be, you don't always need global positioning satellites to know your whereabouts. You could use an old-fashioned compass. Or if you want to go really organic, you could find a hiking path filled with traveler's palms. While not a true palm, the plant grows in a north to south line, giving adept travelers a sense of direction. You'll be hard pressed to find a banana tree at any of Iowa's many state parks, but it's one of the everyday plants you'll stroll past right here at the Greater Des Moines Botanical Garden. 
Everything from palms to desert plant varieties to Asian gardens can be found tucked into the corners of this urban dome. Well, the botanical garden is an absolutely essential part of the cultural fabric of this community. We like to say around here that great cities have great gardens. And if you look across the country and you look across the world at metropolitan areas, large and small, they tend to have some association with public green space. And that association is borne out uh, in, in, in not only in economic development, but in talent recruitment and having that cultural amenity in the community uh, as an asset for people to enjoy. The botanical garden is in the midst of phase one of a capital campaign a $12 million investment that will expand the scope of the facility beyond the recognizable domed conservatory. There will be seven acres of outdoor gardens, and those could expand as time goes on. This is a 14-acre property. Most people don't realize that we actually have that much real estate here. So those first seven acres, including a water garden, a celebration garden, a hillside garden, are really the first steps in seeing out that vision and developing uh, this is a true botanical garden. Welcome to the Living Wall. A biodiverse lineup of 1,716 plants representing seven different species suspended in troughs along the wall. It welcomes visitors through the front door and is the only living wall of its kind in our entire state. Here in the conservatory, the display areas change on average about every six weeks throughout the year. There are two large exhibitions that take place, one during the summer, which our first summer exhibition is opening here at the end of May and is celebrating the aesthetics of food we eat. It's called Food is Pretty. Uh, but the other times of the year, we get the chance to do these sort of dynamic exhibits that might celebrate a particular concept about creating gardens, or in this case, celebrates uh, an art form called kokedama, which is uh, essentially a Japanese word that means uh, string garden covered in moss. Kokedamas are, are a neat way to sort of think about displaying house plants. They are similar in concept to what a bonsai might be. Bonsai literally means tree in a pot and these aren't necessarily trees and they're absolutely not in pots. It's an interesting sort of uh, aesthetic form to appreciate plants in, in a sort of suspended environment. There are ways that people can do this very easily in their own home. We'll have those things featured on our blog. So this is something that people can very easily be inspired with to go suspend these things from maybe their sunroom or, or uh, their kitchen, the window around their kitchen sink. There are several misting stations that ring the rear of the dome. They not only impact the humidity levels inside the dome, but also keep the temperature from getting too high on sunny summer days. On spring days like today, where the temperature is 72 degrees outside, the temperature inside the dome hovers around 90. That climate control is essential for most of the permanent plantings, many of which hail from the tropics. A band encircling the earth north and south of the equator, with mean temperatures above 64 degrees year-round. A garden is always growing and is, is, is never the same from one day to the next. And so we really want to create and craft that relationship with people to keep coming back to the garden, whether it's, it's once a month or a couple of times during the growing season, and then come again in the winter to see what we're doing during the holiday season. You know, it's, it's, a, it's a great institution that has a lot of offerings for the community, and we just want people to be a part of that. Just beyond the plexiglass of the botanical gardens flows the Des Moines River, a popular spot for urban fishermen. River angling is heating up all across Iowa's waterways this time of year. But the data on fish migration for spawning and overall behavior is essential for keeping a healthy population for future generations. In some eastern Iowa riverways, the DNR is monitoring the movements of a unique fish not often found in central Iowa, shovel-nosed sturgeon. Nearly 150 different fish species inhabit the rivers and streams that ripple like veins throughout Iowa's countryside. In eastern Iowa, one so-called bottom feeder is drawing attention from the Iowa DNR's fishery staff, and its movements are under investigation. The tail busted off, and that's pretty common with sturgeon that we lose that, that tail. Very rugged fish. You can see we had one with the tail chopped off. Um, you know, a fish that can live in strong current. You have to be rugged to live out where we're at. You see how the current's grabbing the boat and throwing us around. Um, they live in it no problem. Um, you see their design with those scoots and, and their pectoral fins. They can sit right on the bottom. Their mouth is straight down. They're, they're basically vacuum cleaning out there in very rugged current, something you and I couldn't hold in at all. Shovelnose sturgeon often drift along the main channel of large waterways, hovering at the bottom amongst sand and a swift current. These prehistoric-looking fish don't often stay in the same spot for too long. 
This is how they feed on the bottom. Use these to locate food and they extend their mouth down. I always call them like a hoover back. They're active during their inconsistent spawning cycles, and when they do begin a journey, it can span hundreds of inland water miles over a few generations. Those travels, including how far and how quickly, are important data sets for fishery biologists. When I grew up in Burlington back in the 70s, when I was in high school, I used to commercial fish out in the Mississippi. We would drift trammel nets for sturgeon for the smoked fish market. This net goes down at the bottom. It's about six to eight foot tall or deep, but once that current pushes, it's probably three, four foot off the bottom. Just rolling right along the bottom. The fish are gonna get all caught up in that web. And we're gonna... 568. Equipped with a vacuum-sucking mouth, shovel-nosed sturgeon mainly devour aquatic insect larvae. They venture from feeding grounds downstream to spawning grounds upstream. Female eggs laid in an Iowa waterway often hatch within five days, and the surviving larvae float downstream into suitable rearing zones protected from aquatic predators. On the female, we can see it, see how many times you know, she's potentially uh, pregnant coming up here. As I explained earlier, they don't spawn every year. They maybe spawn every other year or every third year. And so um, hopefully through this data set, we can see how often they're coming up here and spawning. This is a girl. If you look at the belly, you can see how dark that stripe is. Full length. If you hold it, it's, it protrudes below mid. Line. See that? See how the belly really droops down? 541. Wait. 600. Shovel nose is the smallest and most abundant species of freshwater sturgeon found in the U.S. and the only kind commercially fished in the entire country. And they grow slowly. They aren't known for becoming massive species inside Iowa's rivers and streams. According to the Iowa DNR, the state record for a captured shovelnose sturgeon is only 12 pounds. Well, you know, we're trying to learn a lot about this unique species, you know. This isn't a fish that's fished heavily, but it is fished some. Um, and, and worldwide, there's certainly a demand on, the, on this species. 23 or 24 species of sturgeon in the world, and every other species except for this one is overfished. Known for moving up and down the Missouri and Mississippi water systems, shovelnose are increasingly creeping into Iowa's inland tributaries. And their presence could have an unwanted and perhaps unexpected impact on the ecosystem. By studying here, we can really compare that to the Mississippi. And um, again, some of these fish might actually end up in the Mississippi anyway um, and be caught commercially or by anglers. 533, sir. Okay, give me that. 500 and it's an unknown. 500 and an unknown. 510. When, when people come across our fish, um, you know, you've seen we were putting a tag in the, in the peck fin, and if they come across one of those tags, there's several things we'd like the anglers to do is, is first, you know, get the number of that tag. Uh, try to write it down. It's, you see our numbers are five digits. It can be hard to remember. So if we can write it down right away, that'd be awesome. Um, if they come across uh, any of our tag fish, sometimes we have tag northerns, tag walleyes. We always want to know what that number is and where did they get that fish. And then if they can, we'd like to get a link from it. It's just another reason the Iowa DNR is tracking their movements and keeping tabs on fish some would consider a simple bottom feeder. The organism kingdom fungi has an incredible scope of biodiversity with estimates ranging from one and a half to five million species, including microorganisms such as yeasts and molds. Not exactly the most photogenic subjects, but we found one man who dives lens first into these organisms. Photographer Jim Frink specializes in the more photogenic fungi, and this realm has no shortage of variety. Jim Frink spends much of his free time here, in the wooded hills of Wildcat Den State Park, nestled along the eastern rim of Iowa. With his trusty assortment of cameras, Jim is looking for something tucked near the miles of trails, something many park visitors or hikers would never even pause to explore, 
and might even walk past without knowing it was even there. There are some species that grow with a certain, by a certain tree, and some like dry ground, some are on a hillside, uh, it just depends. It could be attached to the side of a dead and decaying tree, or sprouting along the rocky hillsides, a fungi that Jim has documented for years. Well, I like to think I do, but most likely it's just what I happen to stumble into. Oh, there's quite a variety of shapes and colors. Uh, they're red, blue, orange, green, yellow, black, a little bit of everything. Some are tall and thin, some are short and squat, and everything in between. Mushrooms of every size, shape, structure, color, texture. All of them captivating Jim through his camera lens. I like the, you know, you always like to find the bright, colorful ones, but a lot of the real common ones that are brown look great depending upon the light. Sometimes the lights really is what makes the picture. Using a combination of natural light and some occasional LED assistance, Jim has documented hundreds of different fungi just inside Iowa's borders. Mostly it depends on the person, I think. If you show them pictures, then they like it. Uh, I've had a couple of people ask if I'd take them out, which I do. And you just point things out. And I've seen pictures that people take, and a lot of times they're really bad. So if they're with me, I try to show them about the fill-in light. Uh, you have to lay on the ground sometimes, or kneel down at least, to get a little, you know, on-ground view of them. I like to photograph on a bright overcast day. It's really good light. If you're in the bright sun, I try to use a shadow of myself or have my wife stand in the way to cast a shadow. A rich array of varieties all under the umbrella of fungi, a term many would associate with the household need for a bottle of Clorox. But the mushrooms Jim captures, both in pictures and for the kitchen table, are an essential part of not only his photography, but also outdoor discovery throughout his life. There's a blood root there. This is called a false turkey tail. A little rounded one in here, kind of small. They call them artist skunk. There's a few of the stinkhorns that are really fancy looking. And so uh, they're all from other countries, but they're starting to pop up here and there. If you join Jim for a morning hike, you'll soon discover he is filled with knowledge, not only about mushrooms, but the entire outdoor ecosystem's impact on fungi. There's a beetle listening in these ones that have the holes in it, it's called a horned fungus weevil, and they live inside that. Sometimes they sit on top of the mushroom. If you pick them up, they have a real strong chemical smell. Not real pleasant. This one's really old, so it doesn't show it. But when they're fresh, they're pure white, and you take a, a scribing tool, you can draw on it, and that turns real dark, and it's permanent. Jim's interest in mushrooms began nearly 50 years ago, with a childlike fascination and another outdoorsman's photographic inspiration. I met a man once back in the early 60s, and he had some mushroom pictures, and I thought they were pretty neat, and I had always liked mushrooms, so I just started taking pictures. And that was with film camera. As a man that's long explored much more than the common morel, Jim warns the casual mushroom hunter against eating too much of anything out in the wild. Some of the ink caps are pretty good, I like them, but you have a problem if you eat them if you drink anything with alcohol, either a week before or after you eat the mushroom. You don't die from it. Uh, your body kind of turns red and your extremities stay white and your heart races 170, 80 times a minute. A lot of people think they're having a heart attack and after a couple hours it goes away. Jim's images of small, intricate detail often resemble something else in the natural world, like coral on a seabed, or translucent and almost alien-like life forms, or a massive sponge on a stick, or macaroni and cheese, except it's shooting out of a decaying stump. Nature's beauty is on display in every image, every shot of fungi. But even through the thousands upon thousands of photographs spanning decades of outdoor adventures, Jim knows there are plenty left to discover.
Oh, I don't think they'll ever see it all. With mushrooms, uh, even if you find a common one, they're really nice groups sometimes, and you know, it's nice to find something like that. A lot of times you see insects you've never seen before. So it just, you just look around and take it as it comes. That wraps up this springtime edition of Iowa Outdoors. You can find any of our more than 60 features covering Iowa's outdoor environments and recreational opportunities online at iptv.org slash Iowa Outdoors. IPTV's talented producers and videographers will be crisscrossing the state in the coming months, gathering images and stories for our fourth season of Iowa Outdoors. We're going to bring you a new episode the first Thursday evening and Saturday mornings of each month throughout 2014. We'll leave you with some of nature's smallest details here at the Des Moines Botanical Garden. Funding for Iowa Outdoors is provided by the Claude P. Small, Catherine Small Cousins, and William Carl Cousins Fund at the Lincoln Way Community Foundation in Clinton County to support nature programming on Iowa Public Television. Mid-American Energy, helping to harness renewable sources of electricity through their investment in wind power. Information is available at midamericanenergy.com. Mid-American Energy, obsessively, relentlessly at your service. Many of Iowa's natural wonders you'll find on IPTV can be found in Iowa Outdoors Magazine, the Iowa DNR's premier resource for conservation, education, and recreation activities. Subscription information can be found online at iowadnr.gov.